Sometimes I feel like I've already seen everything that's gonna happen. And it's a nightmare. Hey everyone, I'm Maggie, and today we're gonna break down and explain Cherry ending, and as is to be expected, a spoiler alert is now in effect. The first half of Cherry follows the eponymous character as he moves into adulthood, marrying Emily and enlisting in the army as a medic. Next. And I found out that I was actually colorblind. Explains a lot. Can I still be a medic? You know what color blood is, right? When he gets to Iraq, the experience is significantly more dire and gruesome than he'd anticipated. Fire, cover me! Freeze! Stay on me! As someone who already felt alienated and dehumanized by the institutions that control our lives, his experience is intensified in army where his commanding officers seem to have little regard for the trauma that Cherry and his comrades are experiencing on a regular basis. Private! I gotta go, baby. I love you. Cherry struggles with PTSD. He's unable to sleep because of his violent dreams, and he has anxiety attacks so bad that the Xanax he's been prescribed doesn't help. However, his old friend James Lightfoot does have something that is able to take the edge off Oxycontin. When he goes to an army doctor Thomas Lennon for help, he receives the same kind of cold indifference that he has from every other authority figure in his life. The doctor writes his own prescription for Oxy, which leads to Cherry's addiction to the powerful drug. If you didn't know any better, you would have thought that this guy was Biff from Back to the Future. But he wasn't. He was pills. <laughs> and he was coke. Cherry's addiction to Oxy becomes another in a series of major problems in his marriage with Emily. Although he is the one who was sent to Iraq, she also deals with consequences. While Cherry's nightmares stem from witnessing the existential horrors of war, hers come from seeing the person she loves most experiencing immense suffering that she can't heal. She is devastated that the life she had imagined for herself and Cherry is slipping through her fingers. Feeling that she is at the end of her rope, Emily also begins using Oxy. Earlier in the film, someone describes seeing the horrors of war as getting your cherry pop. While that metaphor is used in a very specific instance, it also applies to the broader feeling of hopelessness that both Jerry and Emily are experiencing after his deployment. Life now seems to them cold and uncaring, as if the hands of fate can wipe the board clean at any time. In a heartbreaking scene, they lie in bed together, both high, and reminisce about their lives before Cherry joined the army. He brings up a happy memory from before and mutters, can't see that we'll ever make it back there though. She replies, no, but I'm okay with that. They may never be able to get their old lives back, but while they are on drugs, they at least get a respite from the horror of their current situation. As Cherry announces in a voiceover narration, that was how we became addicts. The couple quickly moves from Oxy to heroin. They begin their journey intending to be habitual but responsible users, but quickly end up in a vicious cycle. They never have enough money for the amount of drugs they need, but they are so deep in the thorns of addiction that not having the drugs makes them dangerously ill. This leads them to desperate acts. After dumping a significant portion of their drug dealer's stash down the toilet in a fit of paranoia, Cherry and Emily find themselves in a serious financial hole. Their dealer, who they call Pills and Coke, isn't particularly menacing, but his supplier, known only as Black, looms as a serious threat over their head. Dude, how much fucking shit was even in there? With nowhere else to turn for the incredible amount of money needed to pay off their debts, Cherry decides to try his hand at bank robbery. Don't you touch that fucking phone. Go, 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 Jack. Go, 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 go! 
The decision to start robbing banks represents a major shift in Cherry's worldview. We've seen him at the bank several times previously in the movie, and each was a frustrating experience of being caught in a web of bureaucracy. The faces of the tellers were obscured by shadows, and their behavior towards him was clinical and dismissive. But when he does his first robbery, that changes. Their faces come into clear focus as he registers that. Now that he's appended the balance of power, they are afraid and deferential. Understanding this helps Cherry in his career as a bank robber, but it doesn't make him feel any better about it. Cherry has success as a bank robber in so far as he's able to pull off quite a few heists without getting caught. However, even in the haze of his addiction, he realizes he's now on a ride that he can't stop. His continued dependence on drugs forces him to take bigger risks, which lead to sloppy robberies and eventually the death of Pills and Coke. Come on. Come on. which means that Cherry must now deal directly with Black to whom he owes a large sum of money. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notifications about our latest videos. Sure you can. I can't. You can. For your girl. To round up the funds, he partakes in one final robbery, the one the movie begins with before it bounces back to the beginning of the narrative. When we first see the scene at the beginning of the film, Cherry delivers a particularly poignant bit of a voiceover narration. I'm 23 years old and I still don't understand what it is that people do. It's as if all of this were built on nothing. That sense of alienation is at the root of Cherry's problems. Since the beginning of his journey into adulthood, he's had trouble understanding how he's supposed to tether himself to society when, as he sees it, there isn't actually anything real to which to tether himself. As he heads into his final robbery, he understands this enough to know that if he wants to break out of the dangerous cycle this alienation has helped usher him into, he needs to hit the eject button. Cherry steals enough money to pay off Black, but allows himself to be arrested afterward. You should hit that alarm for me. Thank you. Although prison is far from the optimal resource for someone in his position at that moment, he clearly sees it as the only available option to break free. In an epilogue that is told mostly throughout wordless montage, we see that prison does indeed help Cherry get out of his addiction cycle. He detoxes from heroin, begins working out and going to group therapy sessions, and reads in the library. When his parole hearing comes up, he's granted an early release and finds a smiling and healthy Emily waiting for him as he exits the prison gate. The film ends on that moment of hope. Life has been hell for our protagonist. Ever since he had his metaphorical cherry popped and much of his misery has been a result of living in a web of bureaucracies as systems that left him feeling dehumanized. He's always been a smart, intuitive and a compassionate person, but the larger world rarely took that into account. In coming out of the other side of his long ordeal, he seems to have found strength in his own resilience. The system he is forced to live in may treat him just like another account or pair of hands on the battlefield, but that doesn't mean he has to view himself that way. Even if he's failed by his bank or the army or the pharmaceutical industry, Cherry has found that there are things in this life he can invest his time, energy and love into that make life worth living. I hope you enjoyed this video! Check out this other recent clip from our channel and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.